What does Lethal Company hide off camera from the player while exploring the moons Rend, Dine, and Titan? Lethal Company's most dangerous moons are the last ones on the list to tackle. We'll be both breaking the game and checking out things behind the scenes to see how the remaining monsters work. From nutcrackers to masked players, there's a lot to cover. Like, did you know what a gesture looks like inside the box? Or that there's an inaccessible test room still present in the game files? So I hope you enjoy this deep dive into Mike Rowe's dirtiest job yet. As usual, I'll hit you guys with a very brief summary so we're all on the same page. When we start a game, we're able to go directly to the following moons right at the start. Experimentation, Assurance, Vow, Offense, and March. However, we're going to be exploring the last three moons on the list, which includes Rend, Dine, and Titan, all of which cost money to visit. Each moon has similarities and differences, so traversing to the buildings on these moons will vary. One of your teammates can stay on the ship as they view a map and assist you from within the ship, while the others brave the unknown and try to retrieve precious scrap without dying. As the day progresses, things become more dangerous as more entities will spawn, so be sure to safely leave before night. Once meeting your quota or running out of days, you then take your scrap over to Jeb at the company, get that money, and head out for another awful day on the job. Oh yeah, and if you don't make quota, the company shows you just how much you mean to them, as they yeet you into space, which we'll be looking at from a different angle a bit later in the video. For our first moon, we're going to be heading to Rend, a frozen rocky moon. This moon's planet orbits a white dwarf star. The low visibility seems to be only taking place on the immediate surface of the moon. If you didn't know already, when scanning for items, it will ping anything within your vicinity. We can get a better look at the scan from a different view, as you can see, and also with the snowstorm cleared up, we get a much better view of this place. As we look down at this area from the sky, you can see the following entrances to the facility. The fire exit is pretty secluded, and there's also a story log collectible nearby it. There's a small cabin that the players will be able to go in, but from the looks of it, seems abandoned. However, something I found more interesting is that this wall that's just out here by its lonesome turns out it's a dam wall, which is the same model that is used in level Vow, just bigger in size. When going back to confirm this, I accidentally deleted the wall, revealing the water it was holding. I was able to walk in and out of the water as I pleased until this forest giant crashed the party, which eventually ended with me dying. Back to Ren though, this wall can be traversed on, and as you can see there's really not much else to it. If the player were to get out here, it would be easily comparable to Planet Hoth from Star Wars. Rest in peace, Tauntaun. Going further out, we of course can find the stored multiplayer model sitting out here in the great beyond. Exploring the endless plains of snow doesn't reveal much, so I make my way back to head down below. Navigating into the interior, you can see that we have the mansion variant, opposed to the industrial variant. The mansion includes bigger rooms and halls, which also includes lots of bookshelves. It's just more open for the most part. The industrial variant feels more claustrophobic, if you were to ask me. And in this area is where I met a new friend, which is the Jester. This walking music box will pick a single player to stalk. Appearing harmless at first, it'll follow, but when it starts playing music, that's when you know you're in trouble. It'll play music and eventually release this monstrous head out of its box, then proceed to hunt you down and one-shot you. They are extremely fast, and by slowing the footage down, you'll see how it grabs the player with its mouth like we're a chew toy. It then quickly gets bored and violently spits our corpse out of its mouth. Before the Jester activates kill mode, we can take a look inside the Jester's box, and we will find its head shrunken to fit within. It looks like an itty bitty skull. We can also see its size changes rather quickly when jumping out of the box. In a few different instances, I tried killing this Jester, and, um, it definitely cannot be killed if you didn't know this already. The shotgun even proved useless against them. On that note, let's head to the next moon, known as Dine. Just like Rend, Dine is a frozen, rocky moon, with it being unlikely for complex life to exist here. This moon also, naturally, has low visibility on its surface. However, getting an eye in the sky reveals an overall better view of this playable area. As you can see, the fire exit is much closer to our ship in this level. If the player is persistent enough, they can scale this slope that the fire exit sits on. The extension ladder can also be used to access this door a tad easier. If you were able to get four of these extension ladders in your inventory, you could technically escape out of the playable area. Mind you, this would be far more difficult with low visibility, but as you can see, it is doable with well-placed ladders. Might as well save yourself the trip though, because there's nothing out here, aside from the leftover multiplayer models, which you wouldn't be able to see with the player. But I digress. The only other finding I came across while clipping in and out through this terrain involved the main entrance building. Beneath the surface, we can see the building is bigger than it appears, and you can see this little compartment within it. Outside of normal gameplay, the player could get down here, as seen. 
I ended up falling though, and uh, found myself in between the surfaces, which is always trippy looking. We had the mansion variant this time around, and I decided to try and see if maybe the turrets could kill enemies. I figured if landmines could do it, why not turrets? However, come to find out, the turrets, in fact, do not kill any of the monsters. I tried this in various instances and different monsters with similar results. It was definitely a learning experience and a funny one at that. Sort of felt like I was at a crowded party while shoulder to shoulder with these brackens as we all danced about. I don't know why these brackens didn't attack me either. Regardless, it made for a fun dance party. Let's talk about these nutcrackers though. A Christmas decoration that's wielding a sawed off double barrel shotgun. These guys are clunky and loud, so you'll definitely hear them coming. The nutcracker will lock onto the player when they are in view and will proceed to blast them with their shotgun. As you can see, at point blank, the blast will one shot the player. Rest in peace, fellow employee. The plus side with these enemies is that you can in fact kill them though. If you can manage to get five hits on the Nutcracker with a shovel, it'll collapse to the floor presenting its shotgun, which we can obtain. These shotguns are fun, but dangerous to use. Dropping them can even cause the gun to go off, so be careful. It was at this point though, that I decided I wanted to collect a bunch of shotguns and face off with a horde of, well, our next guest, masked players. If you're not familiar, these foes can make a damn the job turn sour real quick. When they attack, they grab you and basically infect our character, creating another masked player through us. These guys can run, jump, and even follow the player outside and all the way to the ship. But I want to face multiple masked players. So I spawn a handful just to see how I fare and manage to blast the first one that arrives. Shortly after though, something unexpected happened. I forget I was still invulnerable and in the midst of my fight, I clearly get overwhelmed and one of the masked players gets me. However, instead of changing into a masked, one would just spawn and I wouldn't die. And uh, as you can see, they begin to pass me around one to another, continuously puking at me and essentially trapping me. This results with an endless amount of masked players being created through this never ending loop. It got to a point where the game started to slightly chug from the amount of masked players that were being created. I tried to see how many were made, but figured a lot is the answer I'm gonna go with. Luckily, the game never crashed though, allowing us to get a look at this masked ant farm. Just look at them go. But now I think it's time to head over to the final and most expensive moon to visit called Titan. So Titan is a frozen rocky moon with low visibility. Who would have guessed? However, the best thing about Titan is the rather short distance to the entrances. Outside the company building where we sell our scrap, Titan's building is by far the biggest of any other moon facility. It's ginormous. I did some exploring atop this huge structure and within these little compartments, but as you can see, it can be walked on if you manage to get up here. Walking along this rooftop, I discovered down below what might be the multiplayer models we've seen in every other level. Leaping off the roof to get a closer look confirms that it is in fact the models. Unlike the previous levels though, these models are above the map where we're able to view them with our player. I would like to point out that you can potentially get up here without mods. It would involve using the jetpack. This thing is expensive and sort of difficult to use. That being said, if you manage to not overheat and explode, like I did the first few times, you can get on top of this building and even make your way to these leftover models as well. That is, if you want to spend 700 something dollars on this trip, but not much else is going on out here minus the endless landscape of snow. These player models gave me an idea though. So I headed back to the playable area, then moved the player models to this location so we could get a closer look at them with our player. I don't know why I didn't do this sooner, but as you can see, they're impervious to my attacks. The models are labeled as player number and will just stand there for the remainder of the day. I brought one inside and tried to see if enemies would interact with it and, well, the Nutcracker couldn't care less about the model as it kills other Nutcrackers. I forgot to mention they have friendly fire on. I continued with trying out other various enemies and they too only had one interest, which was trying to kill me. Did I mention the slime and coil heads were not killable? Well, if you didn't already know, now you do. I had a funny moment while doing all of this as I unintentionally created a conga line with the coil heads. Despite the bloodlust for my body, we had a good time. My next idea involved trying to get the interior monsters to come outside and play with the exterior monsters. I tried this previously by just attempting to spawn them out here with no success. So this time I tried bringing the surface of the moon down to the facility interior. My goal was to get the outdoor creatures to interact with the indoor ones, but as you can see, this thumper demonstrates that they can't leave the interior of this facility, regardless if I delete the walls, etc. E for effort, I suppose. So for my last enemy encounter, I give you Ghost Girl. Your time is limited once you start seeing this little girl. 
She'll only haunt a single player as she successfully creeps that player out and stalks them. Once she decides to stop messing with the player, known as the haunting phase, she'll then proceed to skip towards you, and once she catches you, you'll be ultra dead. Like the coil head, she removes the head of her victims. She kind of looks like Eleven from Stranger Things, except dead, and our little friend cannot be stopped. The zap gun will not lock on, the shovel has no effect on her, which makes sense, and the shotgun just spits right through her. So I decided to spawn a bunch of these girls and see what they do while I'm outside. It appears I may have broken the game a bit, but these ghost girls all appear to be electric sliding to the same location. It was a bizarre sight, as I found them all clipping within each other. Eventually, they ended up appearing outside with me all grouped up. They'd run and disappear when I'd approach them, but by activating an alternative camera, you can see these girls running in place where they had disappeared, essentially being hidden only from the first person camera that the player uses. It was at this point I decided to spawn more, and continue to torture myself with being haunted. As you can see, things begin to escalate pretty quick. And yes, I may have messed with some of their sizes. It was actually kind of amusing playing keep away from all these terrifying spirits. It's interesting to note that they'll follow you for a good while out here before they disappear. At one point I found myself playing Ring Around the Rosie with this giant ghost girl in the center, but eventually I grew tired of running and accepted my fate, as I ultimately died. Come to find out, this area in which I was being chased around in is also the location of a hidden room. There is a room still accessible in the code that can be re-enabled, and it's a test room with a wooden floor and a few cubed pillars. This is more than likely from the early stages of development where game mechanics were being tested. It could have also been used to test pathfinding for enemies before the current system was finalized. Given the different heights of the objects, it could have also been utilized for lighting and shadow casting as the days progressed, and the sun rotated across the sky. This area kind of felt like a boss fight should be taking place in here, so I spawned a ton of eyeless dogs to make that a reality. You could see some of the dogs walking along the stairs that I disabled from the original moon layout with the collision still remaining. Regardless of my invincibility, these guys are still terrifying to see in action. I recall in another instance not too long ago where I did the same exact thing, but I want to see if lightning kills these guys. As you can see, it destroys them, eventually leaving us with this lovely pile of death. But back on Titan, after removing the test room, I decided to spawn all the monsters that I could. Sadly, baboon hawks were not available, but as you can see, this all made for quite the scenario. Attempting to successfully navigate the situation without dying would be obviously impossible. But with unlimited stamina and of course invincibility, I can at least still have some fun as I round up all these monsters. Eventually, I grew tired of running around and allowed the giants to hilariously and continuously try to eat me. But jokes on them, I summoned some backup. The only force that can kill basically anything, the Leviathans. As you can see, they can consume whatever is in their path. It's pretty great to watch as the monster's numbers dwindle. Just look at them go. Heading back to the ship and back into outer space, I want to take a closer look at the process when we fail to reach quota. From the player's perspective, you'll see that an alarm goes off with flashing lights as we're being informed that we failed to meet the quota, advising that this is the disciplinary process. The door then opens up as it sucks out mostly everything from the ship, leaving the player to die in the cold vacuum of space. Taking a look at this from beyond our player view, we can see that this view is a tad different. We can see our player, along with all the objects floating off, with the large red out of bounds trigger below us. These two big spheres, one much larger than the other, follow the player as we drift further out into the great beyond. Eventually, we'll disappear, and the two spheres that were tied to our world position will be reset back by our ship. Of course, the other player models are out here in the great beyond as well, which prompted me to attempt to create a blockade of players within the ship, to potentially stop myself from being sucked out of this tin can. Unfortunately, I fell victim to space once again, as the player models just stood by idly as I passed through them. But with that, this concludes our game-breaking experience on Rend, Dine, and Titan in Lethal Company. We've had a lot of fun exploring the entirety of this game and its various moons, and getting a closer look at all of its inhabitants too. Not to mention the shenanigans in between. I hope you enjoyed this Out of Bounds endeavor, hit the like button if you did, and I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers!